If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 9, verses 20 through 27 is where we're going to begin. And we're going to be looking at the mission of Christ. And you know, I think it's an important... Uh, it's important for us to note something, and and um, I, I I really feel like God has made it clear that that I need to to make it clear to you today. I was actually watching uh, on this particular point here about Christ's death being intentional, you know, on purpose. It wasn't like, oops, you know, things went bad and he got killed, and so he came back to life as a as a fix to being killed. Okay, he he dying was part of the plan. It was part of the mission, and there's been a remake of the movie Ben Hur. How many of you guys? are aware of that or have seen that there has been it's really good I haven't I haven't been that excited about it and so Stephanie's like hey you know we should watch it and so we had a little movie night and, and most of the kids came and, and it was actually phenomenally good I highly recommend it it's a story about the Roman Empire and these two brothers one was born a Jew in Jerusalem the other one was a, was a, uh, a Roman orphan that had been taken in by this Jewish family well then once Rome had you know conquered Judea and and it become a province of Rome then this the Roman uh, brother he went off and joins the, the the Roman army and he comes back you know kind of a bad guy and um, you know there's just this ongoing story but through the midst of it you see Jesus ministry and his death uh, on the cross as this guy the the brother who ends up actually losing everything who's from Judah um, and his name's actually Judah Ben-Hur he loses everything and ends up a slave on a Roman galley which is like horrible and and so anyway it's a fantastic story and there is a moment in the movie when Jesus stops and he, he tells him earlier in his during his ministry that that he's he gives he gives him water Jesus gives him water when he needs it well when Jesus is carrying his cross to Golgotha Judah Ben Hur stops and gives Jesus the water and then he picks up a stone to to uh, to you know throw it at this Roman soldier and try to knock him out and help Jesus out you know and Jesus stops him grabs puts grabs his hand and 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 holds his hand over the rock and he says it's my I'm, I'm dying of my own free will. In other words, don't don't stop this. You know this has to happen, and um, it was a powerful moment in the movie and a powerful mo moment for us. I think as we recognize that his mission was to die, his mission was death, and that is why it is our mission as Christians to be ready to put to death and to finally, once we get to that place in our spiritual walk, put to death the sin nature and the flesh. That really the old person that we were, we kill that off and we become a new creation. And that's really the antithesis of this uh, whole discipleship process is allowing that, that worldly, um, pagan, you know, anti-Christ person that we are just from birth in, in our nature. And we are ending that person and a new life is beginning. All right. Just kind of like if you've ever seen like an old tree stump, you know, a tree that got cut down and then it kind of a sprout comes out of that. A new tree starts to grow. If you've ever seen that, maybe that's an image of that, a mental picture of that. So let's look at this verse in Luke uh, or these verses in Luke chapter nine. But you, he asked them, why do you say that I am? And Peter answered, or who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, God's Messiah. But he strictly warned and instructed them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes, be killed and be raised the third day. All right, so he, t he told Peter when, they, when they're having this conversation that that was, that was the plan, okay? That was going to happen. He knew it. And he wasn't just guessing. I mean, he knew that was going to happen because that was his mission. Because remember, a sacrifice had to be made. That's the whole deal with like the whole lambs being slain, which, you know, now that we have lambs, it kind of brings a whole new, you know, like mental picture to to that. Uh, hopefully when you guys come out for the picnic, you can see it, which, which our lambs are kind of big now, but but uh, hopefully we'll have some babies in maybe March. Uh, and, but that this whole idea that something has to be killed, something has to be sacrificed, you know, and if that's your livelihood, you know, I mean, a lamb probably runs, you know, now a good lamb is about $100, $125. And so, you know, when you go and sacrifice a lamb, you know, that, there's a cost to that. All right. And so Jesus, he becomes that sacrifice. And so his death is required because the law requires that. What are, what are the wages of sin? Death. All right. So that there has to be an answer. And so that's why he, he had to die. Verse 23. Then he said to them all, if anyone wants to come with me, Okay, in other words, what does that mean? If you go with him, what are you saying you're going to be? Starts with a D. Oh. Disciple. Yeah, okay, good. You're right. There is a lot of answers to that, but I was looking for the word disciple. All right, so if you want to be a disciple, 
okay, then, all right, this is like a math problem. You know, disciple equals, you must deny him, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, so not like once, but daily, and follow me. For whoever, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. You know, it amazes me how uh, oftentimes th these, these truths kind of cross platforms. It's just like, uh, you remember the, the servant that was given the talents, and uh, the one that in the end that was, was the wisest was the one that risked his talent, the one that invested his talent, and he made more came from that. All right? It seems like in God's economy, in God's you know, army in his, his whole being that standing back and like huddling and, and, and going on defense and playing it safe is never the, the right call. It's always going out and doing something, always risking it all, putting it all on the line and doing something different. You know, for some of you, it's not a really a big deal. You've been a Christian for so long you don't you don't care about that you don't care to give your time you don't care to give money you don't care to, to set aside a day just to, to focus on God but for for a lot of us we really struggle with that you know we're just running around like on Sunday and we just it's like we, we're at church when we absolutely have to be and then we're doing something else some other time you know or or it's sermon time and it's like oh that's boring you know I was here for worship or I was here for setup or I was here for the meal and so now I'm just gonna play on my phone or goof around or lay down or whatever and, and we have a real hard time with that, with, with having a desire to be a disciple. I can remember when I was a young person, I mean, I was a teenager, discipleship was not a priority for me, okay? Girls, yes, you know, sports, yes, you know, whatever other activities, yes, but discipleship, no, not a priority. Now, fortunately, there were adults in my life that it was, it was a priority for them that I be discipled, okay? So I'm, I'm blessed because of that, but it wasn't because I had that desire, at least not in the early days. It was because somebody else was willing to disciple disciple me and and uh, almost in, insist that I become disciples and so that is a blessing so we have to we have to choose to take up our cross daily we have to choose to 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 not just do the bare minimum all right which which is you know let's just be honest that's kind of what it comes to sometimes it's like well what what did I commit to what's the bare minimum I can get away with you know and and, so, and a lot of you guys are like well fortunately in in 2017 you can go to church like two times out of four and that's okay you know because a lot of other people are doing it too you know unlike if you lived like when I grew up in church you know if you went if you missed you know more than one Sunday a month you might as well just you know start packing your bags now because you're going straight to hell that's just pretty well how, how it was all right so cultural change but the need to be disciple is probably greater now than ever. So let's, let's keep going here. So then he says, Forever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life because of me will save it. What is a man benefited if he gains the whole world, yet loses or forfeits himself? An interesting question. An interesting question. Even I myself live my life at times where it looks like all I'm trying to do is gain the world. Right? I'm trying to get the farm into shape or get my family, you know, all everyone taken care of, all their teeth and medical issues and schooling and, you know, all that. Or, you know, even, even church stuff, okay, which that can be ministry, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes you can make it about, oh, well, you know, I've got this goal or I want to do this or, you know, and so we, we kind of leave God out of it. You know, believe it or not, that can, that, can, that can actually happen and does happen. And so we spend so much time working on gaining our life that we're actually forfeiting truly what, what matters. And it's amazing to me, anytime there is, in, in the last hundred years, for example, there's been some major national catastrophe. What's the first thing that people do? First thing. Yeah, pray. Yeah, panic. Yeah, go, go to church. You know, even though they haven't been there for like 10 years, you know, go visit their family. You know, they turn towards things that, that matter. You know, all of a sudden, that, that raise that you're working for, that promotion at work that you're working for, that car that you're saving up for or whatever, that is not as important, and all of a sudden, the things that we know really are, they become important. It's amazing how, how that happens. And so we have to recognize that truth and live for those things every day. 
Instead of just being, you know, like the world, I think the, the, the dichotomy or the contrast is that that's what the world does. You know, they, they're just kind of whatever. It's like my, my dogs. We've got quite a few dogs at this point, and it seems like there's more dogs coming all the time and cats. But um, they, they think like very unilaterally, okay? When, when the food is here, they are here, okay? When the food is over here, they are over here. All right. And they are they just they're just dogs. That's all they know to do. And there's really not a whole lot I can do to change that because they're just there's certain things that they're going to do because they're dogs. But the Bible says that we're not like that, that we're created in the image of God. So we can act in spite of just those simple things that come into our mind, you know, like, you know, chocolate is good. I like chocolate. Therefore, I'm going to eat chocolate endlessly until I can't walk anymore. You know, so we can choose differently and we must choose differently. And if we're going to decide to be a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, that is what is required. And then he goes on to say, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the son of man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and that of the father and the holy angels. So, so let's talk about that. What does that mean to be ashamed? What does that look like in real life? Who can give me an example have you ever been ashamed? Have you ever acted ashamed? You know, I think when we when we think of that, I think uh, of it in in some of the ways that were shared. I think of it in terms of you know me being embarrassed to admit that I'm a Christian or to correct a, a wrong that's that's being done um, in my presence. You know, sometimes we, uh, especially when we're younger, we just kind of go with what everyone's doing. Well, even even when we're older, we go with whatever people are doing at work or at school, and we're not necessarily the ones doing it, but we're obviously not sticking up for what's right but i'm gonna i'm gonna suggest a couple things <clears throat> that may hit kind of close to home and this isn't an attack on anybody don't think i have this list of okay well you know these three people need to hear this okay this is i'm just saying this but here's some here's some things to, to kind of make it real i think when we refuse year after year to to go on mission trips or to or to go to outreach activities i think we're showing that we're ashamed when we refuse to to get our families to church consistently, I think we're ashamed. When we don't tithe, I think we're, we're ashamed. And you know, th that's a hard thing to hear because I know that some of you guys don't do some of those things, you know, or sometimes or part of the time or most of the time. But I think that's that's where the rubber meets the road because either we're, we're either following him or we're not. And if he says, okay, if you love me, if you're going to take up your cross and follow me, here's the things you got to do. And we choose not to do it for whatever reason, okay, some of the, I'm not saying you're not justified, but I'm saying that, that you're saying you're shamed. You know, in other words, you're, you're going to love the world more. I've got to hang on to the worldly things more because without those comforts, without that stuff, then I just I can't live, you know. And so, and that's a hard word. Yeah. Uh, about taking up your cross was meant to be comfortable. That's right. No, it's not at all. So now, now, before you feel like I'm hammering on you too much, I mean, uh, the you know when you point a finger, there's always three more pointing back, right? Okay, so so I have to, I, I certainly struggle with those same things. That there are, there are areas where I just really, I have a hard time paying the cost of being a disciple. So so I get it. So don't hear me, you know, up here the angry preacher, you know, trying to beat beat you into submission or anything like that. But just wanted to say that to because sometimes I think we don't realize when we're acting ashamed of the gospel. Sometimes we think we're good, we think we're safe, and we realize, you know, when the, when the truth comes to the end, that, that we're not, that we're not okay, that, that things are not okay between me and God. Because we want them to be, I want things to be okay with me and God, but I know that there are things in my life, choices that I'm actively making now, that, that's, a, that's causing separation between me and God. There are things that I know aren't right, things that I've got to get right. Because someday, all of this, all the fluff is going to be gone, and I'm going to stand before God. And everything that I've ever done is going to be laid out. Every single thing. And I tell you what, I'm going to be ashamed then when I rejected God, when I chose to go my own way. I'm going to be really ashamed. And I would much rather not experience that when I get to that moment by not being ashamed of God now and by living my life for Him. He suffered loneliness, all right? Number two, he suffered anonymity. 
All right, I'm going to actually read this from the book. It says he spent the first 30 years of his life under the radar, unnoticed, uncelebrated, and overlooked by his community. His choice to suffer anonymity can only truly be appreciated when he viewed when viewed in light of the exaltation he rightly deserved as God. All right? So in other words, he he was I mean, it's kind of like it's kind of like um being the most talented, gifted ice skater or Olympian of some kind, and no, but nobody ever knew. You never went to the Olympics, you never won a gold medal, but you're still the best. And no one's ever going to know that. All right, that'd be, that'd be tough to live with. That'd be tough to live with. And even beyond that, I mean, he's God. He's all-powerful, all-knowing, and yet most of the world never realized that. Third way he suffered was rejection. All right, he was re obviously rejected, and he was rejected when he taught and preached the gospel. I mean, how many people? I mean, a lot of people came for the food, okay, and then they were gone. All right, and when it got really hard, all right, and he was one of the greatest preachers ever in, in the sense that he started out with a really big group of people, and he grew it down to, like, a, just a handful of people. And, in fact, at the very end, like Annette mentioned, they couldn't even stay up and pray with him. I mean, that's pretty, pretty sad. All right, so what does that tell me? That tells me that Jesus was not, willing, was not willing to just tell people what they wanted to hear, make it easy. All right, he, he, he was willing to, to say the hard, cold facts. So, and then lastly, he suffered scorn. All right, he suffered scorn. He was criticized. He was accused of all kinds of things, of being, of, of being a, 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 you know, making demons come or, or doing things by the power of demons. He was accused of being a false prophet. He was accused of being a liar. He was accused of, of treason. I mean, all kind, which is ultimately the charge that got him killed was, was treason. So he was accused of a lot of things and, and, and he was even convicted and served the punishment for those things they was accused of. And here's why that matters. Here's, here's why we, we look at these four ways. When, when we are called to be disciples, and if we accept that task, okay, if we accept that, that we're going to be followers, we have to be willing to experience those, those four different ways of suffering. We have to be willing to do that. And this is, this is where I think the, the crowd gets narrower. Right, and this is why I think there there are mega churches that we see on TV, you know, and they're painting around, you know, like the camera's painting around. And you see thousands, thousands of people, because not always, but a lot of those churches, everything that's always preached there is always positive, right? It's always good, it's always happy, it always makes you feel good. It's more like a self-help lesson than it is a sermon. And you know, I like that. I'm just going to be honest, okay? I would much rather listen to that than to listen to like me right now, okay? I would much rather listen to somebody talk about how good I am and, and how, how much potential I have and how great I can be in the world and, and on and on and on and on, okay? Things that are building me up and make me feel good. Whenever we, whenever we talk about that, that positive things, I mean, obviously there are a lot of positive things about following Jesus. And we dwell on those a lot, but there are, there are hardships, there are things that we are called, to, the paths that we are called to walk that are not easy. And so we, we can either run away from that, which I have chosen many times just to go do what was comfortable, what was easier, uh, what was neater, you know, because sometimes helping people, serving, it can be messy. It can be really messy. Um, it's kind of like when you go into a smoky bar, which there aren't that many of those anymore, but back when I was younger, I mean, there were not that I spent a lot of time in bars, but I worked at a country club where they served lots of alcohol, and it was basically like a big bar. And that was before there were any restrictions on smoking. So I would go to work, and I would make my 425 an hour, and I would leave just like in a cloud of smoke. I mean, I would just smell like that, okay? And I wasn't even smoking, but everyone else was. And so I, until I showered, you know, and washed my clothes, I took that with me, you know? And that's what it's like to, to jump into a world of sin. Hold on just a second, sweetheart. So when, I, when you jump into that world, you have to be willing to accept that. It says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will act making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. Be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for him. Do not be agitated by one who prospers in his way, by the man who carries out evil plans. Refrain from anger, Walter, 
and give up your rage. Do not be agitated. It can only bring harm, for evildoers will be destroyed, but those who put their hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Now let's talk about several things here. This is a rich, rich section. First of all, let's, let's look at verse 7 very carefully. It says, Be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for Him. And here, here's, what this, well, here's what this says to me, or here's what I think the, the point is for our lesson. Too many times we take matters into our own hands trying to solve our problems. Too many times. Too many times. Now, does that mean we should just sit around and not do anything? By no means. I'm not saying that at all. Um, not at all. All right, but what I am saying is too many times, and I can definitely say this to me. Okay, I have this problem, big time. I I just cannot sit still and wait for God to work in the situation. I just have to jump in, Mister Fix It. All right, I'm like, uh, you know that uh, what's that movie called? Uh, yeah, Wreck It Ralph. Great, great show. You need to see that if you haven't. It's kind of a kid's show, but it's a great show. It has a great moral. All right, wreck it, Ralph. You know, trying to get in there and uh, you know, wanting wanting to fix things, but ending up wrecking them. All right, and that's that's what we're good at that, right? So um, we have to to spend a lot more time just waiting for him. Then it goes on and it says, refrain from anger, give up your rage, do not be agitated. It can only bring harm. For evildoers will be destroyed, but those who put their hope in the Lord will inherit the land. And here's what I think this is saying, particularly in this context. Um, oftentimes in life, we are oppressed by evildoers. Okay, no question about it. Why, why do we have a theft insurance? Because there are thieves. Okay, if there were no thieves, we wouldn't have to have that. Why are there locks on doors? You know, why, there are so many things in life that we pay for. All right, which basically we're giving up our time because, I mean, ultimately that when you go earn that money, what you're what you're giving up is time. You're not really giving up anything other than that. So when we give up our time, we're giving it over to evil doers. Okay, I mean, if you're tracking with me, if you know where I'm going. So there there are many things in life. I mean, people that I mean, if you've been injured in a car accident that was your fault, if you know you had a, a somebody an old, when you were younger, an older person that you trusted take advantage of you. I mean, the list goes on. I don't know how there could be a person in this room that isn't affected by people who do evil, all right? But the, the promise is that if we place our hope in the Lord, okay, it's not an automatic thing, but if we place our hope in the Lord, we will inherit this land. In other words, it belongs to them now, but someday it will be taken away from them and we will inherit it. And that is, that is a promise that we have to dwell in. All right, let's get to this last, uh, let's get to this last section. We're going to move into session four. We die with Christ. We're going to fast forward in Luke to chapter 14, verse 25. Now great crowds were traveling with him, traveling with Jesus. And so he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? So let's pause, let's pause for a moment before we go on. So here's the deal. Here, here's what, what I want us to walk away with. What we are required to give up to be a Christian is great. Okay? Because really to sum it all up, we are to give up everything. Everything that we hold dear, everything that we cling to in life, every comfort, every possession, we are to give that up. All right, We are basically to give it to God, and if He allows us to be stewards of it, well, great. All right, But we're giving that up. All right, So when we bought the farm, we knew this is God's farm. We're, we get to, and to this point, we've been allowed to take care of it, but it's not forever. You know, the day may come when we can't afford whatever payments, or we can't continue, and God may take that back. And if He does, it was His. I didn't lose anything. In fact, right now, I'm just being blessed. It's kind of like the king, you know, the king owned everything in feudal times. And if you got to work for the king or you were given a responsibility, then you got to enjoy all the, usually it was really good food, but you would get to enjoy the blessings from that. And that's, I mean, God's our king. And when he gives us something, that's a blessing. All right. We don't, we shouldn't demand it. We don't deserve it. I mean, this whole thing, 
Boy, I tell you, I'm going to roll. You guys are going to have to tranquilize me here in a minute. I have a dart gun, actually, but but I shouldn't probably have told you that, where you can kind of like shoot a cow and tranquilize it. So you probably could take me out, but boy, I'm getting wound up. This thing in our culture about how, you know, I have some kind of right to whatever, you know, free food, free health care, free whatever, it just blows my mind, burns me up. We have a right to nothing. We have a right to nothing. In fact, if the wages of sin are death, and I'm a sinner, I deserve death. Anything above that is just a bonus. I'm getting something I don't deserve. All right. So I don't know where this whole thing come from. Now, am I glad that, that there are some of those benefits? Well, sure. Absolutely. Okay. I've been helped by others. I've been helped by, you know, the government giving me tax breaks or whatever. So I don't hear me saying, you know, if you ever got anything for free, you're a bad person. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying, what I'm saying is we shouldn't expect that we're owed that somehow. That we have an inalienable right to to live a life of comfort and luxury. All right, we don't deserve that. And in this, when we talk about giving everything up, giving up our even our life, that's how we know. I mean, really, if you want to assess yourself at the end of this this six or seven month period, you just got to be honest and just say, okay, you know, am I holding on to stuff or have I given it all up? Does it all belong to the Lord? And that's how you know if you're a disciple or not. Now here's the thing. I don't say that to beat you up. Again, I say that so that you'll know. See, here's the thing. If you're really my friend, okay, and it's pretty well talking to everybody, and to varying degrees, some of you guys I've known for decades, others of you I've just known for a few years, but I know a lot of you guys in here really well, and I would consider you my friends. If I knew that there was a serious problem in your life, I would come and tell you. And, and if I had a serious problem in my life and I wasn't seeing it, you know what I would hope is that you would come and tell me. That's what I would hope. I may not want to hear it, okay? I may not want to hear it. I may get mad at you and not speak to you even for a while. Okay, I mean, hopefully I won't, but it could come to that. It could be that, that I would get be that mad. But I would hope that you would still care about me enough to just be brutally honest with me. I would much rather that the worst kind of friend is the one that just blows sunshine all the time and talk, you know, and never helps. That's not helpful. You know, I think it's better to know. I would rather know, you know, give me the cold, hard truth. I'd rather know the facts than just to be fluffed up and whatever. So when it comes to this disciple making thing, that's kind of where we are. I think we have to get kind of down to the the grind. You know, it feels kind of sometimes like someone's got a, a, a sand, sandpaper and is like sanding our skin. That's got to be one of the worst feelings ever. But that's what it feels like sometimes to be molded into um, something useful. In fact, I have um, I use chisels a lot in woodworking, and and so in a, and when you when you sharpen a chisel, that's really what you do. You take kind of sandpaper on a like a belt grinder or something, and you you run those those chisels on there, or those tools, you know, hand plane tools, and you get them really sharp, and you shave off, and there's little metal shavings that come off of that, and that's what it's like to be made into a disciple. All right, it's not always pretty. It's not clean. It's not easy. It is, it is hard. Let's go on. Otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will begin to make fun of him, saying, the, this man started to build and wasn't able to finish. All right? Which, so in, which is an example of what we're talking about. You know, if I, if I got out my Tinker Toys and, uh, or let's see, I don't know that we have Tinker Toys now. What do we have? Uh, you know, blocks, little plastic blocks, Legos or something like that. And I... I you know, get this, have this handful of blocks and I lay it on the table and I'm all excited and we're talking. I'm saying, hey, I'm going to build a huge castle with this handful of Legos. Well, first of all, you're probably going to look at me like, why are we playing with Legos? But just go with me here. Okay. Hopefully you would point out and say, you know, I don't think you have enough Legos to build a huge castle. All right. I think you're going to need more than just a handful of of Legos. And that and that's the point. That's what this story is basically saying. That you can't bring a hand a little bit of your life and just kind of be like, okay God, there you go. You know, here's a little smattering. And now I'm a Christian, now I'm a follower of Christ, and now my life is going to be full of blessing and joy because, you know, I gave this little handful of my life over to God. Okay? Well ultimately what that means is that the, that the remaining Legos, okay, let's say that I have like this many Legos left in my life. Okay, I have this much of my life still to, to totally mess up, right? And only about this much is going to be 
right in my life, okay? So you can see the problem there. And then he says, in, God don't like that. No, absolutely not. So let's finish this up. 31 says, Or what king going to war against another king will not first sit down and decide if he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If not, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not say goodbye, it's an interesting way to say it in this translation, who does not say goodbye to all his possessions cannot, oh, why did you have to say that? Cannot be my disciple. All right, so moment of truth. Moment of truth. We have to give it all away. Every single thing, every, every thought, every desire, every possession, we have to be willing to give it up. We have to be willing to give it up. That is, that, is, that is the dividing line, okay? It's like the prime meridian, the equator, you know, whatever dividing, you know, the, the field line on the, on the football field, the end zone line, whatever it is, that is the line. And, and a lot of us, we get right up to the line, all right? And, and when God's talking about blessing us, Boom, we're there. When he's talking about grace, boom, we're there. When he's talking about free lunch on Sunday, boom, we're there. But when he starts talking about giving stuff up, whew, I mean, I spent years, I spent years walking away from God at, from, at that when he get, got to that point. Because I didn't want to go be on the mission field, and I didn't want to give up my time serving at church in different places. I just didn't want to do that. I'd rather play video games or do whatever you know that I'd want to do. Walter, you're dying to say something. I can tell. Go for it, buddy. Go for it, man. Do it. Do it. Go uh, for it. My dad used to say, "Only what you give away is what for, what's for God. What you keep." is what you take to the grave. Hmm. What you give away, God can use. But what you keep, He can't. Mm, that's good. That's good. That's really good. Well, we're out of time. We need to close. <clears throat> I, under, I understand how hard it is. And so I know that, that there, are, there are at least a, a few, I hope, that, that are at the line. And you're, and you're thinking to yourself, well, maybe, maybe some of the problems that I'm experiencing in my life are because I've not really crossed the line. I'm still hanging on. I'm still trying to do things on my own, take matters into my own hands. I just, I can't wait for God. I can't trust God. I can't, you know, I've just got to hold on to it all. To it all. Okay, what, and whatever that all means, you know, that, that could be your time, that could be money, that could be something you want really bad, that can be, you know, a career you're, you're in. Uh, I, I have no idea what that is. Only, only you and God know what that is. And some of you are at that edge where you're thinking, maybe, maybe I will cross the line. And you need to know that there is going to be suffering, there is going to be hardship. But what I can tell you is that God is so merciful and he, he, he has so much grace it is, seem, it is seemingly unending when I, for, when I decided really truly I mean there was a time where I came to the altar and prayed a prayer but years later when I really decided to, to cross the line when I really said you know what I'm going to give it up for God uh, what little I had I didn't have a whole lot at that time um, and I had no idea how much God was going to bless me after that all I knew is what little I had I was ready to give that up Whenever that moment came and I finally crossed the line, it was so freeing. It, it was so freeing. That doesn't mean that I didn't try to run back and jump back over the line once and for all. But what it meant was that, that all of a sudden I wasn't strapped down by all, all of those things. I wasn't worried about money all the time. I wasn't worried about you know, how I was going to spend my time or live my life or what career I was going to have or, you know, how I was going to be a parent or, or, or any of those things. All, all I knew was, was that God was going to take care of it. I just needed to be faithful in, in the things that I had control over. I mean, that's ultimately the decision is just to be faithful in what I have control over. And that, that's, that isn't a whole lot. It seems like there's in life, there's just not a whole lot we have control over. But we do have control over some things. And so God says, you take care of these things. I'm going to, I'm going to give this to you to, to handle. And if we take care of those things well, I think he gives us more. 
I really think, you know, we, we can debate and banter about the prayer of Jabez and say, well, was, uh, uh, was Jabez selfish to, to ask God for more? You know, and, and, and God kept giving him more and more and more, and he kept getting richer and, and richer and having more, and we can debate that. But you know what I think? I think that is that when we're ready, God will give us more. I think a lot of times he doesn't give us more because we're not ready. Uh, Stephanie and I were kind of having a conversation slash argument about this this last week about kids and about you know are we going to do that pay this thing or do this thing and I finally kind of got to the point of the conversation where and I said you know what even if I had a billion dollars I don't think I would pay for you know X Y Z because they're not responsible they're not ready to handle that they need to have some skin in the game there needs to be some sacrifice on their own end. And I think that my, and, and this is just me talking, okay, but it, my experience in my life has been that until I'm faithful with a little bit, God doesn't give me anything more. I have to be faithful with what little I have. And then if I ever am faithful with that, he seems to just keep piling it on. When I get to that next level and he's like, okay, well, you handled that, so here you go. And you know, when I think about it, if, if you, I know there's some of you guys are managers, or you've been managers, or you've had employees work for you. I mean, isn't that how you operate? I mean, you kind of look around at the employees that you have and, you, and you're like, well, he can handle nothing and she can handle a lot, you know, or whatever. And so you just kind of give them what they can handle. When, when I was a waiter, um, there would be people that could handle two tables. And so they would get two tables. And there would be people that could handle six tables and they would get six tables. Well, being a young busboy, I was kind of watching that. And I always said to myself, you know, Someday, I want to be the waiter that's getting six tables and not two tables, all right? Because I knew that my manager was watching to see who could handle that. And so I worked towards that so that when I became a waiter, you know, I was one that got more tables because I could, you know, was, was a good manager that I was willing to just run out there and take care of everything and remember orders and get, get things right and take care of people. And so, I mean, it was hard, but I was willing to put it in. Now, I don't know that it's always that clean, so don't, you know, try to... Be like, oh, well, okay, well, I got it figured out. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to trick God, and I'm just, I'm gonna do this, and then He'll give me, you know, don't, don't go there. All I'm, all I'm saying with that is that if we're, if we're faithful in the small things, God will bless us, and He will, He will give us what we can handle in life, and, and, and we have to choose to, uh, to do things well with what little we have. So as we pray, I would, I would ask this. If you're, if you're considering crossing the line first, I would say, do it, you know, cross the line. Just, you know, I, see that? I'm trying to think of an appropriate way. I have to filter out because I have to think about what my wife will allow me to say, what my mother will allow me to say, you know, when they're present or, when they, or what people on YouTube will, uh, will say. But, but it's kind of like, you know, giving a universal traffic sign to the world. I think ultimately that's what following Jesus is about. It's just saying, you know what? I forget it. I'm, I'm done with the anger. I'm done with the doubt. I'm done with the guilt. I'm done with doing things my own. It's time to do it Jesus way. It's a better way. I promise you. You might end up a leper in a cave in a faraway place, but I can promise you you will be a lot happier person than a billionaire sitting fat and happy in, in the middle of America. Because that might sound really good. I mean, it sounds pretty good to me right now, you know, having a billion dollars to spend and just kind of sitting here and doing whatever. It sounds really good. Not a problem. But I tell you what, I've, I have not personally met billionaires, but I've listened to a lot of them talk about stuff, and they do not seem particularly happier uh, than I am with my small, uh, not billion dollars of money. And so... Uh, I would encourage you to, to first cross the line. And second of all, I would say this. For some of you guys, you're just way off and you're just, I mean, as soon as I, you know, said whatever comment, you know, you're like, dude, I'm, just forget that. I'm not even close. Um, I would say this. I, I would say, I would ask you to prayerfully consider what, what is it that is causing you to think those thoughts? You know, what, what is so good about your life now that would make you, that would keep you in that that zone away from there and lastly I would say this if you you crossed that line recently or years ago I would say just keep on going don't be discouraged don't turn away don't quit just keep on going because one day this race will end and we will stand before God and all things will be made known and we will see what treasures we have stored up for ourselves in heaven 
and and I hope that that uh, even a few of us in this you know at these few tables today that God will look at us and say well done you good and faithful servant let's pray God I thank you for uh, I thank you for all these friends I, I'm I'm trying to be thankful for the the message today it seems hard it seems very challenging um, as I hear it as I see the three fingers pointing back at me Lord, I just sit with these friends, though, and recognize the truths that are here. And I pray, Lord, that as we consider these things, I pray, Lord, that you would give us the courage to, to truly know what it means to be a, a disciple, to know what it really looks like to, to be willing to, to sacrifice ourselves to follow after you. God, we live in a, in a place where things are really messed up. And evil is rewarded and good is criticized and mocked and discouraged. And it is very difficult to, to live in that situation. And it is very difficult to avoid worldliness and worldly pleasures. But God, we know that ultimately good will win, good will overcome. And we will, we will reap whatever we have sown, whether that is evil or good. And, and today, Lord, I, I pray as a, as a concerned brother as a concerned uh, friend um, for those that are here or that can hear my voice um, on, on the computer, that, that, Lord, I pray that they would choose those things which are good, those things which are long-lasting, those things which will bring blessing and goodness into their life, things that are pure and, and holy. And, and, God, I pray that... Um, that you would help us to not be deceived by the enemy who, who is, is whispering all kinds of lies even now, you know, um, who might be stirring things up even now. Um, I, I pray against that, Lord, and I pray that your, your still small voice would win out. And that as we, as we exit this, this nice facility and as we walk back into the challenges and hardships of life, that you would give us a renewed courage. That we wouldn't walk away just defeated or frustrated, but that we would walk away with a renewed sense of hope, knowing that your grace covers everything, that your forgiveness covers everything, everything that we've done, every stupid, foolish, selfish decision that we've made. You can forgive us right now in this moment, and then we can walk away guilt-free. We can walk away having no claim against us. And so I pray, Lord, today that there would be repentance, that there would be those that, that confess their sins and that will walk away guilt-free, free from sin. Lord, would you change us? Would, we, you, would you use us to make disciples? Would you help us to embrace these truths ourselves so that we can teach others? We thank you and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.